The history of ocean liners during times of war offers an interesting, yet often overlooked facet of maritime history. These opulent vessels, originally crafted for luxury travel and commerce, found themselves operating crucial roles during the 20th century's most important global conflicts. Dozens of ocean liners would be requisitioned for wartime use, and of these many would be lost to German U-boats, while others would do many crossings, becoming known for their dependability during the war. Today we'll be unraveling the multifaceted roles of ocean liners during wartime, focusing on their requisition for military service, conversion into floating hospitals, and the measures implemented to safeguard them from the dangers of warfare. Welcome back to Compelling History. Today we continue our four-part journey through the history of ocean liners with part three, how ocean liners served their nations during times of war. Check out part one and two on our channel to learn how ocean liners emerge from sailing vessels and the intense competition in this emerging industry. Make sure you're subscribed so you know once part four is released next week, and don't forget to like and subscribe to help out the channel. Part one, wartime requisitions. While it may not seem apparent, ocean liners indeed had military applications, playing a pivotal role in transporting troops and cargo across oceans during and after global conflicts. Transporting troops constituted a significant portion of their duties, with some being refitted to function as hospital ships capable of providing medical facilities near the front lines or transporting wounded troops back to friendly ports. Besides these primary roles, ocean liners were also frequently used to evacuate both troops and civilians from war zones or to protect against religious persecution threats. Governments possessed the authority to nationalize industries during times of war, enabling them to requisition a company's ships to help the war effort. For instance, countries like the United Kingdom requisitioned ships based on their suitability for either troop transport or as hospital ships. Although they were also employed to move equipment and other cargo, these were the primary functions of ocean liners during both World Wars and the Korean War. Companies would be compensated by governments for the use of their liners, often at rates below market value. Yet many regarded the service of their ships as a patriotic duty. These companies would receive contracts after their ships were requisitioned, outlining the compensation they would receive, both upfront and in the event of a loss due to sinking. During both World Wars, the British Empire utilized a fleet of ships that it subsidized for companies like Cunard and White Star Line to transport troops from faraway colonies such as Canada and Australia to the European front lines. For instance, in the First World War, liners like RMS Olympic, the Titanic's sister ship, regularly undertook the perilous journey across the Atlantic, carrying troops and essential supplies to support the European war effort. Olympic earned the nickname Old Reliable due to its numerous successful crossings, even sinking a German U-boat during one voyage. Other notable ocean liners like the Aquitania served in multiple theaters during both World Wars, ferrying troops to and from the front lines. However, ocean liners were not limited to merely picking up new troops and returning them home after the war. They actively played a role in supporting the war effort. These liners were sometimes used to transport troops between battles on Pacific islands or to move large numbers of troops between different theaters of war, as seen in Operation Pamphlet. During Operation Pamphlet, four ocean liners were utilized to carry Australia's 9th Division from Egypt, where they had participated in numerous campaigns against the Axis powers. These troops were urgently needed in New Guinea to relieve the 6th and 7th Divisions, despite calls from Australian Prime Minister John Curtin to delay until the North African campaign was completed. Departing from Port Tufik, this convoy included the RMS Equitania, Queen Mary, Ile de France, and New Amsterdam, escorted by two destroyers in the Red Sea and two cruisers during the open ocean portion of their journey to Perth. While transporting troops was the primary function of ocean liners during both world wars, they also played a crucial role as floating hospitals in areas lacking such facilities, though this role was more prominent during the First World War. These ships were responsible for treating and housing wounded troops, as well as transporting them to larger medical facilities if necessary, while docked at a port. Liners were often refitted to accommodate hospital beds, operating rooms for wounded troops, and living quarters for doctors, nurses, and other crew members while on board. International law, as established by the Hague Convention, set various guidelines for the operation and treatment of these ships. One of the most noticeable guidelines was the appearance of hospital ships, such as the USNS Comfort, which are required to be painted entirely white with a large white cross on every side to indicate their status as hospital ships. They are also prohibited from carrying offensive weapons, with this distinctive paint scheme intended to protect them from attacks while in transit. However, during World War I, both sides often disregarded these guidelines, aside from the paint scheme. Like the Olympic, another of Titanic's sister ships was requisitioned for wartime use. Just months before its scheduled launch, the RMS Britannic was commandeered by the British government and converted into a hospital ship. It entered service in the Mediterranean in December 1915 as His Majesty's hospital ship. 
HMHS Britannic, boasting a bed capacity of 3,309. Several operating rooms were situated in what were originally the first class dining room and reception area. However, the Britannic's career was shorter than the Olympics, lasting less than a year. In November 1916, it struck a mine off the coast of Greece and sank in just 55 minutes, resulting in the tragic loss of 30 lives out of the 1,066 people on board. While hospital ships are not supposed to be targeted, such incidents were distressingly common during the First World War. Many were torpedoed by German U-boats, like the HMHS Landovery Castle, which was struck by a torpedo off the coast of Southern Ireland in June 1918, resulting in the deaths of 234 people and leaving only 25 survivors. Part two, protecting ocean liners at war. During both world wars, traveling across any ocean, but especially the Atlantic, was crucial for the war effort, but also perilous for the sailors and passengers on board. In the First World War, almost 5,000 merchant ships were lost due to torpedoes, mines, and attacks from surface ships. The Second World War witnessed a lower number of merchant ships lost, around 3,500, but the voyage across the North Atlantic remained just as dangerous as during the previous war. Protecting these ships became a top priority for the Navy and the British Empire during these conflicts, leading to the implementation of various tactics for their protection. Among some of the most effective protective measures employed for merchant ships, such as ocean liners, were ship convoys and camouflage, or dazzle, painting scheme. While each of these methods had its advantages, these ships still remained vulnerable to U-boat attacks, which significantly impacted the British war effort and resulted in their high number of losses. Convoys were a common tactic used in the Atlantic and elsewhere during both world wars to protect merchant convoys carrying supplies and troop ships. Notable ocean liners such as the RMS Olympic and Mauritania were included in these convoys. The size of these convoys varied considerably depending on the theater of war. For example, some convoys crossing the Atlantic had dozens to hundreds of ships, both merchant and naval, while convoys traveling between Australia and Eastern Africa sometimes had just one destroyer accompanying a group of merchant ships, or none at all. This variation was due to the presence of a large fleet of untraceable U-boats during the Battle of the Atlantic, while the journey to Australia could often be completed outside the known range of Japanese naval ships on patrol. The size of these convoys also depended on their distance and the number of troops they were transporting. While the Atlantic and Pacific convoys are well known for their high troop usage and ship losses, a lesser known aspect of World War II was the Arctic convoys between the Soviet Union and other allied countries, such as the UK and US. Out of approximately 1,500 merchant ships transporting supplies to the Soviet Union between 1941 and 1945, 85 were lost along with 16 Royal Navy ships. Although not a perfect system, these convoys played a vital role in ensuring the safety of ocean liners and other merchant ships throughout both world wars. While dazzle camouflage was more commonly used during World War I, it involved painting ships with randomized patterns of geometric shapes in contrasting colors. Although it may seem counterintuitive to make ships stand out, the purpose of dazzle camouflage was to make it harder for U-boats to accurately determine the direction, speed, and course of the ship when firing. Approximately 1-200 ships, including ocean liners like the Olympic and Mauritania, received this iconic form of camouflage during their war service. The effectiveness of dazzle camouflage remains a subject of debate, with some studies suggesting limited effectiveness, while others argue that advancements in submarine technology rendered it increasingly obsolete. Dazzle camouflage may not have made ocean liners and other merchant ships invisible, but the Allies would also employ other measures to help conceal them from the enemy. Keeping convoys, especially lone merchant ships, hidden from German and Japanese detection was the only truly effective way to protect them from being sunk before reaching their destination. This was achieved through various means, with the primary one being the maintenance of radio silence among the convoy while underway. This reduced the possibility of the enemy overhearing their location or destination. Another measure employed during World War II involved disrupting or deceiving the enemy's radar systems by sending back the same frequencies they were using. The final measure we'll discuss is the complete blackout during the night to reduce visibility from U-boats and reconnaissance planes. This blackout included all navigation lights, deck lights, and windows, which had to be covered with blackout curtains or have their portholes closed to prevent any light from escaping. This practice was similar to what many British and others did in cities and towns to make air raid bombings more challenging during World War II. Part three, returning after the war. Some ocean liners would be released from their requisition early when they were no longer needed, while all of them would eventually be released following the conflict. After both world wars concluded, many ocean liners remained in service for months after the fighting had ended, primarily to transport the tens of thousands of troops back to their respective home countries. 
As the number of returning troops dwindled, more liners were released from service and returned to their home ports for refurbishment to their former civilian state. However, some liners did not survive until the end of the war, while others, although they survived, were too worn down for profitable civilian use. Consequently, ocean liners were included as part of war reparations, as outlined in the Treaty of Versailles. Ocean liners were returned to service as early as possible due to their immense fuel consumption and crew requirements when compared to smaller vessels. The British government worked with ship owners to establish timelines for when they anticipated the ships would be back in civilian service. However, there were instances when ocean liners were released from service only to be requisitioned once again. As mentioned previously, the Britannic sank after striking a mine in December of 1916. It had been released from service weeks earlier due to its high operating costs and the smaller number of injured troops being returned from the eastern Mediterranean. Nevertheless, due to changing needs in the war, Britannic would be recalled back into service prior to its final voyage. Upon being returned to ship owners, some liners were refitted for passenger use, while others were no longer viable for commercial purposes and were eventually sent to the scrapyard. Some of these ships would have been requisitioned toward the end of their operational life anyway, and the strains of wartime use made their condition worse, as was the case with other liners. Conclusion The history of ocean liners during times of war offers a compelling and often overlooked facet of maritime history. These magnificent vessels, originally designed for luxury travel and commerce, found themselves thrust into pivotal roles during the 20th century's most vital global conflicts. As we have explored in this video, they served as more than just modes of transportation. They became instruments of war, symbols of resilience, and lifelines for nations in their darkest hours. Thank you so much for watching the third part of Compelling History series on ocean liners. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to like and subscribe to help the channel grow. Next week, we'll be coving the final part of the series, Industry Decline. Make your subscribe so you don't miss out.